Hey, what's up guys? This is Dr. Vivek Palipuram bringing you the next lecturette in ECP 170 Computer Systems and Networks. So far in our journey of MIPS programming, we have seen instructions such as arithmetic instructions to perform arithmetic operations. We have seen branching instructions to perform branching operations like if else statements, for loops, while loops, and do while loops. We have also seen the base offset addressing mode to access values from the main memory. To this end, we use instructions such as LW and SW. We used LW to load a word from the main memory into one of the CPU registers. And then we used SW store word to store the value from the CPU register to one of the main memory locations. In this lecturette, we are going to set our basics for functions in MIPS assembly. So we are going to see what are the typical operations or opcodes that one needs to use to implement functions. So this lecturette is just the basics. More important stuff is going to come in the following lecturettes. Before we proceed any further, please make a note on your lab schedule. These are your labs that are due on these dates. So please make a note of it. The discussion on MIPS Functions cannot begin without discussing what the program counter is. So let's discuss what the program counter is. And let's discuss why this particular register is so much important for us to understand in order to implement functions in MIPS. Now remember guys, whatever code that you write, whatever instructions that you write in MIPS assembly, they are going to be stored one after the other inside of the main memory. So whatever code you develop, using MIPS, they are going to be stored inside of the memory. And each instruction of MIPS assembly occupies four bytes. So for example, add i $s0, $s0, $0 is going to occupy four bytes, just like any other instruction. And these instructions are going to be stored one after the other inside of the main memory. So the first location will store instruction one, then the next location is going to store instruction two, then instruction three, and so on and so forth. Now, because your MIPS code is stored inside of the main memory, one instruction after the other, these instructions are going to have their own respective addresses. You must have noticed in Qt Spim when you load, or rather when you reinitialize and load your Qt Spim simulator with a code, you would see that in the text section, you have large address values for different instructions. In this case, for just for, for the sake of example, let's consider that our first instruction is stored at address four, then the next instruction is going to be stored at address eight because each MIPS32 instruction occupies four bytes, then 12, and then so and so forth. CPU needs to execute these instructions one after the other, so it has to fetch these instructions from the main memory. And how does the CPU know from where to fetch the next instruction? It is where this 32-bit special register called the program counter, which tells the central processing unit from where to fetch the next instruction. So the program counter is going to hold the address of the instruction that needs to be executed next. So for example, in this case, initially PC is initialized to four. So the CPU is going to execute the instruction that is located at this address, which is INS1. The next PC is going to increment by four. So the next value of program counter is equal to eight. Next, the CPU is going to execute the instruction two because it is that instruction which is stored at address eight. And this PC is going to increment by four every time unless it encounters a branching instruction, in which case the value of the PC is going to change to the address at which the label of the branching instruction is pointing to. So far in your MIPS codes, you have implicitly modified the program counter when you were implementing different branching, branching instructions. As and when a branching instruction is met, depending on whether or not it is true or false, the value of the PC is either going to change to the label to which the branching instruction is pointing to, or it's going to increment by four. So let's take an example, or let's take a look into an example of the MIPS code and see how this program counter changes with each instruction's execution. So consider this particular MIPS code for example. As I mentioned before, all of your MIPS codes are going to be stored inside of the main memory. Each of these instructions is going to occupy four bytes. Hypothetically, let's say that the very first instruction add i to $t0, $0, $0 
starts at address four, then each of these instructions are going to be placed one after the other spaced by four bytes. What I would like for you guys to do is pause your video here and try to reverse engineer. What, you, what I would like for you guys to do is to write a C code for this MIPS assembly. Please pause your video and try to write it out. And once you are ready, you can unpause the video and we can move on. Okay, I hope you guys got the chance to look into the reverse engineering of this MIPS code to a corresponding C code. The corresponding C code is going to look something like this. You have variables or temporary variables rather, T0 and T1 initialized to zero and two respectively. Then you have this while loop which executes until T0 is less than T1. And inside of this while loop, you increment T1 by one every time. So that's the C code for this MIPS assembly. Now let's observe how your program counter is going to evolve or how it is going to change with the execution of each of these instructions. At the beginning of the program, the program counter is going to store the value equal to four, which is the address of the very first instruction. Because the value of PC, the program counter is four, the CPU is going to fetch an instruction at address four, which is in this case, add i to dollar t0, zero comma zero. So t0 is initialized to zero. Next, the program counter is going to increment by four. So the next instruction will be fetched from address eight, and that is add i to dollar t1, zero comma two. So I initialized t1 to two here. PC is again going to increment. Now it's going to be equal to 12. So the next instruction is branch if greater than, if t0 is greater than or equal to t1, then I branch to label to address 24. This statement is not true. This branching statement does not evaluate to true. So PC will not branch. Instead, it will just increment by four and it will go to the next instruction address, which is 16, at which point CPU will execute this instruction. So it increments t0 by one and then it increments then the PC again increments by four. So now the PC value is equal to 20. So the CPU is going to fetch the instruction from this address 20, which is jump to label at address 12, 12 or rather jump label to address 12, meaning that PC now is going to hold the value 12. So PC changes to 12. So the next instruction will again be fetched from this address 12. I perform this comparison comparison does not hold true, I increment t0, I jump back to address 12, I again perform this comparison. This time the comparison holds true because t1 is two and t0 is also two, so BGE holds true, so I branch to address 24. So PC is equal to 24. So the next instruction that will be executed is li $v0, 10. And then PC again increments by four. And the last instruction that the CPU is going to execute will be the syscall, meaning that it's going to exit this program. So that's how your program counter evolves with the execution of different instructions. PC normally increments by four every time, unless it encounters a branching instruction, which holds true. Okay, before we start implementing functions in MIPS assembly, I would like for you guys to think about what happens when we call a function. Let's write a simple C program, which involves calling a particular function. Let's say that I have int main here. Assuming that I have already performed some initializations, I call this function called sum, which evaluates the sum of B plus C and stores the result back in A. Then I try to print f this value, a, the sum, and then some other code, and finally main exits. This sum function looks something like this, int sum, int a, int b, and this sum function returns the sum of a and b, return a plus b. So let's see what happens when we actually call a function. The very first task is to place the function arguments in standard location from where the function can find them. So inside of this main, this is the place where we are, this is how, or rather this is how we are passing values to this function sum. 
Next, we should be worried about how to save the current program's location in order to return to later. Because when you call a function, after we return from the function, we need to proceed from there onwards. So the next important item is how to save the program's current location. How to save the program's current location. So the next location that needs to be executed after executing the function sum is printf. So I need a mechanism to make sure that my program's execution proceeds ahead from printf statements or statement onwards. All right, next we jump to the function location. So we need some mechanism in MIPS that enables us to jump to the location where the function is. This function is going to execute using the arguments that are provided to it. It is going to execute using the arguments that are provided to it. So we need to make sure to use a mechanism with which the function, the callee, is able to use its arguments and perform its operation. The function is going to produce its output. It's going to do its own task. And then finally, it's going to produce an output. It may or may not return a value. In this case, sum does return a value. So we need another mechanism to return the value from this function. And then finally, there should be a mechanism for the program's execution to proceed from the next instruction onwards, which is printf in this case. So we need the following requirements and we need certain mechanisms in MIPS to enable us to, to meet all of these items in our checklist. Now some important questions with respect to functions. Can a function change local variables of its calling function? The answer should be straightforward. No, the function operates in its own bubble. It should definitely not change the local variables of its calling function. Otherwise your logic of your code may simply break. Next question, what happens if the function changes a zero, which was also used by the calling function? Now the answer is a chaos will ensue. It's a definitely a problem because your function has corrupted whatever values that your calling function was working with. That should never happen. So you can see here that we should find a mechanism or rather we should use a mechanism such that functions, each of the functions context is somehow safeguarded from being corrupted. So we need a mechanism to save the context of all the functions inside of our code. So keep this requirement in mind. And I'm going to show you how we can implement these different mechanisms to make sure that the context of a program or context of a function is not corrupted. All right. So here's what you'll be, you'll be doing in MIPS assembly. You must do all the background work for functions that the compiler did automatically in high level language. So for example, when we consider this particular C code, your compiler is responsible to save the context of the main function, which is calling this another function called sum. It is responsible to switch the context to this function sum and then enable sum to retrieve its arguments and also enable this function sum to place its return arguments at appropriate location and then your compiler manages the return from this function back to the main code and proceed the execution from printf statements onwards. But in MIPS, you are going to do all of this background work because you have great power over the hardware. With great power comes great responsibility. Okay, so let's look into some basic items that we would need from our MIPS assembly in order to implement functions. And that includes some more additional set of registers. Now remember, we were discussing about a mechanism with which we can pass arguments to functions. We can pass arguments to functions in MIPS assembly using these registers, A0 to A3. So there are four registers with which we can pass arguments to these functions. Should you require to pass more than four arguments to a given function, we tend to use some other places such as stack in order to pass arguments to those functions. But for the sake of this course, we will assume that most of our functions can be satisfactorily written using functions that take 
at most four arguments. So we will use these four argument registers, A0, A1, A2, A3, to pass arguments to the callee or the function that needs to be called. We also discussed that we need a mechanism to return values from functions when they are done. In MIPS, we have two return registers with which we can return values, and those are V0 and V1. If you notice, in C programming, typically we return just one single value. For example, if I have like int sum as my function definition, then it is going to return just one value. There are some other ways of returning multiple values, but we are not going to go there. In MIPS, you can have a function actually return two values using these registers, V0 and V1. We also discussed about a mechanism that tells us or tells our program from where to proceed with the execution after the function is done. The address of the next instruction from where the execution needs to proceed ahead is actually stored in this register, RA. So RA is the return address register. What it essentially does is it stores the address of the next instruction that follows the function call because that's the place from where the execution needs to proceed ahead once the function is done. In MIPS functions, we also manipulate stack or stack space a lot. And we tend to do that using this register called the stack pointer $sp. We are going to discuss about stack pointer in a whole greater detail in our future lecturettes. This lecture is just meant to form the basics or the basic fundamentals of implementing functions in MIPS assembly. So we are going to focus on these items for now. A0 to A3 registers for arguments, V0 to V1 registers for the return values, and the RA register which stores the address of the next instruction that follows the function call. We need some more instructions in order to call a function and also to return from a given function. In order to call a function, we use this particular operation or the opcode JAL, which stands for jump and link. What jump and link does is it takes an argument called destination here, which essentially is a label. Now, if you recall, you have been working with labels a lot in your C code when you are performing branching instructions. Jump and link is actually a kind of a branching instruction here where we are asking our CPU to branch to this label called destination, which is a user defined label. And at the same time, link, meaning that RA is going to hold the address of the next instruction that follows the JAL instruction. So RA is going to store the address of the next instruction that follows JAL. And that's why it's called jump and link. So we, we, uh, we are asking our CPU to jump to this location called destination, at the same time perform some sort of a linking so that we return back at the proper place of programs uh, to proceed with the program's execution. So this is how you're going to call functions using the JAL. JAL takes one argument, which is the label. You have been working with labels all the time. You have been looking, working with labels like if, else, while, for, and so on and so forth. You can JAL to those labels as well. We also need a mechanism to return back from a function. And that mechanism is the JR instruction or jump register instruction. Jump register instruction takes in one argument, which is the register, which holds the address of the next instruction that needs to be executed after the function is done. Typically, or almost always, this register is $RA. When I execute JR $RA, what happens is PC, PC now, stores whatever value RA is storing. So now the CPU is going to start executing from this address onwards. If you notice when we call or when we execute the JAL instruction, RA stores the address of the next instruction that needs to be executed after the function call. So that was the RA when we called JAL. When we are done with the function, we need to place this JR RA so that now 
PC is equal to RA, which is PC plus four. So now the CPU is going to start executing from the instruction that follows the JAL operation or the function call. So these are some of the jump instructions that you'll be using for implementing functions in MIPS assembly. Okay, so let's look into some basics of functions in MIPS assembly, what, what your code needs to perform in order to perform function calls safely and securely. First of all, number one, your program needs to save the context of the registers of the calling function or the caller, because we don't want the callee, the function that is being called, to inadvertently modify the registers that were already being used by the caller. So for example, here I have main, I need, to, I need a mechanism to make sure that variables A, B, and C, they're safely secured for the main function. So I need to make sure that I save the context or the registers that are used for these values A, B, and C. Next, the program needs to save the arguments in argument registers A0 to A3. So these arguments B, B and C, they need to be placed in the argument registers so that sum is able to access them. Number three, number three, we actually need to call this function called sum, and we do that using this instruction, jal function label. So if sum is a label inside of my code, I will call that function as jal sum. So what jal does is it's going to save the address of the next instruction in the RA register. So RA is going to be equal to PC plus four if PC is currently pointing at JAL sum. After that, I'm going to proceed ahead and execute sum. Sum needs a mechanism to store the return value A plus B. So it's going to store them in either, of, either one of these registers, V0 or V1. The convention is to use V0 first and then V1 next. We need a mechanism to return back to the next location or to the next instruction that follows the JAL instruction. And we do that using the JR instruction. It's usually JR RA. So now PC is going to store whatever RA is storing. RA is storing PC plus four. So essentially I'm going to start executing the instruction that follows JAL sum. So JR sets PC to RA and PC is going to continue there onwards. It's going to increment by four every time unless it encounters a branching instruction. All right, so those were the basic items that one needs to keep in mind while implementing functions in MIPS assembly. There are different mechanisms that we need to invoke in order to implement functions in MIPS assembly, such as number one, how to pass arguments. We use A0 to A3 registers for that. Number two, how to actually call a function. We use JAL instruction for that. Number three, how do we return values from a function? We use V registers to place the return values. Number four, how we actually return back to the next, ad, next instruction following the JAL instruction. And that is done by executing JRRA. So those were the basic mechanisms that one needs to keep in mind. Now those mechanisms will get much more clearer once we actually see a full-fledged example. So let's take a look into this example of problem uh, of writing a MIPS code with functions. So please pause your video here and give it, a, give it your best shot to convert this entire code to MIPS assembly. Please do not worry whether you are getting it 100% right or wrong. I would like for you guys to give it your best shot. Once you're done, you can unpause your video and we can move on. Okay, so let's, let's move on and let, let's write a complete code for this particular uh, C code. Let's write a complete MIPS code for that C code. So I'll partition this place into two parts so that I have enough space to write my code. So I'll start my code here. So it's going to start at dot text, so dot text, followed by dot global main. And then I have my main label, which is essentially a label for my main function. So notice here that main is a function, which, and in this case, main is also a label. 
let me create a register map because register map should always be consulted as you write your MIPS programs. So for as for my register map, I will use dollar as zero for X and I'm going to use dollar as one for Y. So dollar S one for Y. Next, I need to initialize the registers. X is initialized to five and Y is not initialized. So let's let's initialize the register. Let's initialize the register um, X here. So let's initialize register X to five. Uh, but but you know what? Let's let's also use the dot data space here in order to store those registers. So dot. So here I have my dot data section. Uh, I have I have X, which is dot word, and it is initialized to five. And I have Y, which is initialized to dot word zero. I need I need some other items here as well in order to perform the printf statements. For example, I I need to printf uh, Y is equal to whatever number. So uh, that has to be a message. So let's say message dot ASCII z in double quotes y is equal to and i also need a new line or rather a line feed so lf dot ascii z in double quotes slash n all right so that's my register map i'm going to use s0 to load x and i'll use s1 to load y so let's initialize the registers now so we will initialize registers so I'm going to load word into dollar as zero x. Now remember, x is a label to the memory location that stores the value five. So when I say load word as zero comma x, I'm loading a value from this memory location into register x, into register as zero. So now as zero holds the value x. Similarly, I'm going to load y. So s1 is going to store y. Next, I need to call this function y is equal to function comma x. So call function. And I need to pass this variable x to this function. We use a zero registers or rather a registers to do that. We have just one argument that needs to be passed. So I'm going to use a zero register. So I'm going to set a zero to s zero. There's a variety of ways in which I can do it. Let's use this method of using the add instruction because I have not given you a lot of instructions in my lectures. So I'm going to show you how you can still use those limited number of number of instructions to perform different kinds of operations. So add i to dollar a zero dollar s zero comma zero. So now a zero, the argument register is equal to s zero, which is x. Next, I need to call this function, jal function. So I call this function jal function. And then after this jal function, whatever return value is, I need to place it back to y. So I will assume, I'll assume that the return value is placed in v0. So return value is in v0. So v0 needs to be moved to y. So uh, I can do something like add i to dollar s1 dollar v0 comma zero. So in this case, y is equal to the return value, whichever value is being returned. And then I have this printf statement where I need to print the value y. So you can take a look into the example codes given on ECS 17, ECP 170's web page to see how to print different kinds of messages involving strings and numbers and so on and so forth. So here, first we need to print the string y is equal to. So let's print that message. So printing message one, I need to first load v0 with value four because four is syscall code for printing strings. And then I'm going to do, a, uh, uh, then I'm going to uh, actually load the argument register with the address of uh, this message so because i need to pass the argument to this print function the item that i would like to be printed so load address dollar a0 message one because i need to print y is equal to and then i'm going to do this syscall 
Next, I need to print the result, print result. So for that, to print an integer, I need to load v0 with value one. Um, and then I'm going to load the argument register with s1. So I can do something like add i to dollar a0 dollar s1 comma zero. So a0 is s1, the value that I want to print and then followed by a syscall. Okay, follow, all right, so this would have printed it. Next, I just need to exit this code. That's what is happening in main. After I print, I exit the code. So exit code. So for that, well, before I exit, exit the code, I also need to print the slash n character. Okay, so let me print the slash n character and not move too fast here. So print, slash n so for that i load v0 with value 4 i load a0 register with the slash n character so i'll load the address of lf to a0 and then i'm going to do a syscall so that would print the new line character and after that i exit my code after that i exit my code so exit load to v0, 10, and then I do a syscall. So this ends main. So that's my main function. Let me take your attention to this function, jal function. When we call jal function, we not only branch to this label function, but this, the internal mechanism of your computer systems is going to store the address of the next instruction, which is at PC plus four, PC plus four into the RA register because we are performing jump and link. Each of these instructions is going to be stored inside of the main memory, one after the other, each occupying four bytes worth of information. So when PC is equal to, or rather when PC is pointing at this location, JAL function, and when I call it, PC plus four, the address of the next instruction is stored in RA register. So this provides us a mechanism that lets us know where to return to after the function call is done. Now let's execute this function here. So function is actually a label to a particular location of the code and here's my function code. All right, so function does nothing. It does just, it simply does three times A plus five. So it performs uh, three times A plus five. And I know that A zero is argument. The argument was placed in the A zero register. A zero was used as a bucket, so to speak, to place the value in, and that bucket would be accessed by this function and used inside of this function. So I need to perform three times A. Now I have not given you a mul instruction as of yet, so let me give you the mul instruction. I'll show you how to perform multiplication. So I'll load a temporary, let's say a temporary value or temporary register, let's say T0 with value three. Then I'll, I'm going to say mul to less, let's say uh, another temporary register, let's say dollar T1, dollar T0, which is three times dollar A0, which is your, uh, the ar argument register. So this performs three times A. And then I need to add five to it. So add, add I to dollar T1, dollar T1 comma five. So now T1 stores three times A plus five. I need to return this value three times A plus five. The return register is V0 register. So I need to place this return value in V0 register. So let me place it. So I can do something like add I to dollar V0 dollar T1 comma five. So now the return register is storing the value three times A plus five. And then finally, I need to jump back. So jump and return dollar ra so when i execute jump and return dollar ra pc pc stores whatever value ra was storing ra was storing pc plus four so now essentially i have made my pc point from here or rather point from here to here now so that's how this execution proceeds ahead so let me let me show you 
how this code is going to evolve with respect to your PC's uh, movement. So I'll use a pointer to show you where the PC is currently. Okay, so PC is going to start right here, then it's going to move down, then it's going to move down, then it's going to execute, move down here, so jal function. When I call jal function, the address of the next instruction, the address of the next instruction is going to be stored in the RA register. So RA is going to store PC plus four. So now PC is going to move to this function. It's going to execute that, then this, then this, then this. When it executes this instruction, PC loads whatever RA is storing. RA is currently PC plus four. So now the new value of PC will be equal to PC plus four, which was stored in RA. Now PC plus four initially was this location right here because that's what RA was storing. It was storing the address of the next instruction following the JAL. So your program counter will now point to this instruction add i, it's going to execute add i, then li, then this instruction, then syscall, all the way down to the end of this code. So that's how your PC is going to evolve with the execution of this code. All right, so I'm going to end this lecturette right here. So in this lecturette, we set up our basic understanding of how to implement functions in MIPS assembly. Remember that functions are just a piece of code that are referred to by a label. For example, in this case, function is just this simple piece of code that is referred to by this label. This label points to the very first instruction inside of that function. In order to pass arguments, we use the A registers to pass the arguments. In order to return values, we use the V registers. In order to call a function, we use the JAL function. When we call a JAL function, PC or, or rather the RA register automatically now stores the address of the next instruction that needs to be executed after this function is done. JR RA enables PC to return back to the next instruction that needs to be executed after the function call. So this is just the basics of how to implement functions in a rudimentary manner in MIPS assembly. But there's more to it. What happens when this main function uses a whole lot of registers for computations? And what if this function also needs to use a whole lot of registers that main is currently using? We need a mechanism to save context of these individual functions. That's the most important thing that we need to worry about right now. So we will worry about that in our next lecture. Ed. I hope you enjoyed this lecturette. Please go over this lecturette one more time just to make sure that the basics of MIPS functions is clear to you. Adios, guys.